Hello, everybody. My name is Anna Campoverdi, and I am the director of the Joseph A. Unano Latino Institute. The Institute provides scholarships, cultural programming, and professional development to students across campus. Uh, to learn more about the Institute, you can visit our website, which will be dropped into the chat box, and you can also follow us on Instagram at Jowlishu. Um, so today we welcome you to our African Diaspora Black Identity and Colorism panel, or ABC panel for short. This year's panel is themed Family Matters, a two-part series that will have a special emphasis on Your family call structures has been forwarded to an automated and the Afro-Latino communities. Tonight's discussion will Three, highlight the complexities seven, of seven, dynamics five, and gender. Ooh, hold on, I hear someone. All right, so we can continue. So tonight's discussion will highlight the complexities and dynamics of gender and sexuality uh, within a family and community structure. We encourage you to use the chat box feature to drop your thoughts, comments, and questions during the panel. I would like to thank all the student organizations that joined us in supporting this event, and a special thank you to the team of students and staff who helped conceive, design, and plan these discussions. The Black History Month Committee is a task force of students, faculty, and administrators across campus working to plan Black History Month activities and so that celebrate the Black community. You can learn more about these efforts by visiting the link in the chat box, which one of our students will drop. So tonight, Beatrice Simpkins will lead this important conversation. Beatrice is the executive director of the Newark LGBTQ Community Center and has emphasized her work in the LGBTQ community, the importance of changing the dynamics of oppressive social and economic systems that deny people their full freedom to be and live as they choose without fear, violence, or bias. Beatrice is currently pursuing her doctorate in transformative social change from Saybrook University. So to tell us more about the center and introduce this discussion, I'd like um, to turn over the mic to Beatrice. Hi, can you hear me? Able to hear me? Okay, good. So uh, hello everyone. And thank you for inviting me to this very important discussion this evening. I am Beatrice Simpkins. I am the executive director of the Newark LGBT Community Center, which is currently located at 5 Washington Street in Newark, New Jersey, which is the build the main library location. We are on the first floor. Uh, we were originally formed on New Street as uh, Liberation and Truth Social Justice Center. We moved to Halsey Street and then we started uh, uh, we named the center the Newark uh, LGBTQ Community Center. The center really was started in response to the death of Sakia Gunn, which occurred on the streets in Newark in 2003. She was a, a black lesbian. Um, I guess if you had to um, uh, talk about her identity, she would have been more of a male identified lesbian. She was um, approached by a man who of course, she rejected his advances and then she wind up being murdered. And so uh, it took 10, year, 10 long years of struggle, uh, but the original founders were able to open up the center in 2013. So we are in our eighth year of operation. Our anniversary would be in October. The center uh, is um, serves people predominantly in Newark, but we also serve people from all over the state, especially during COVID. We've definitely seen an increase in people in isolated communities looking for community. And so they've been contacting the Newark Community Center looking, you know, for virtual support groups or, or just virtual spaces to meet and socialize because, you know, a lot of a lot of the social activities of our community has been dramatically impacted by COVID. Things are closed and, you know, we're not able to to even we don't even have on site services at the center right now. Everything at the center right now is virtual. And so the center is located in Essex County. There's there's about 800,000 people that live in Essex County. Uh, the, the, the county demographics are, are kind of even with 48% white and the balance of people being people of color, uh, immigrant populations, et cetera. And the, the, the uh, rate of poverty for folks in the county is 14%, but in the city of Newark, the, county, the poverty rate is double, that is 28%. Newark is predominantly a, 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 a city of brown people, right? Black and Latinx people make up about 76% of the population there. And so it makes sense that you have twice as much unemployment and twice as much 
homelessness and twice as much everything. <laughs> Let's put it that way. That isn't necessarily uh, a good signs for people who are black and brown and uh, Latinx and immigrant. And so uh, we serve people through now virtual programming. Uh, we are having a Black History Month programming tomorrow night. We're, we're doing drag bingo once a month now. We will have a, a upcoming event that talks about the COVID vaccine and how that's impacting folks in uh, in our community. You know, we are disproportionately behind in terms of getting getting access to the vaccine, and we are disproportionately ahead when it comes to COVID infections and death. And so, this is the climate in which we operate. Of course, you know, uh, people. You know, there's a lot of social justice issues that are rampant in our country right now, and some of those issues are also quite relative to what's happening right here in Estes County and Newark. And so that's a little bit about uh, the Newark LGBTQ Center. Of course, we are we are we are a nonprofit. We have a board of directors, uh, and we really are an all volunteer organization. And so we always encourage people to uh, volunteer. We have volunteers who help us do our virtual programming now. And so um, we rely heavily on the support of our community. We rely heavily on the support of uh, individual and private donors in order to keep the center open. It was open really as a safe space. It was a place for people to come, especially young people. There wasn't any such place in Newark at the time. It mostly operated from the afternoon into the evenings. And we were there for people of all, all, all colors and all ages. Uh, we um, saw quite an influx of, of trans folks, queer folks looking for a place to be safe, to be authentic and to find like-minded people that they could make community with. And so that really was the emphasis. And so now, now that the physical space has been taken away, we're trying to create that same virtual safe space for our community as well. And so that is the Newark LGBT Community Center story. And so I am here to moderate the discussion this evening and I want to welcome our panelists. Our panelists are Patleen, Amber, Elizabeth, and Jalen. So everybody, let's give a little wave to the other. Hi. <laughs> and so we're going to get into um, some conversations about gender sexuality in the community, gender and sexuality in families, and what does that look like and what are people's experiences and how do you feel about some of these issues that are impacting your, your lives at this time? And so I'd like to start out about talking about gender and sexuality in the school community. This is a Seton Hall University event, and I think that's a very appropriate topic. And so I'm going to pose questions to the panelists. I will call you by your name, and then I will, you know, I will say the question, and then I will call upon you, and you can answer. Uh, and if someone else wants to jump in, in addition, after that person has finished speaking, uh, please feel free to add to whatever you know thoughts and comments that you might have. And so my first question is, how can teachers and administrators support school children and adolescents in their gender expression and identity? And how can curriculums be more inclusive? And so I think I'd like to start out with Amber because Amber is an alum, right, Amber? Yes, I am. Yeah, so I'd like to hear your perspective and the perspectives of the students who are currently in school. And so if you could, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you so much, Beatrice. Um, I am an alum and I'm also a teacher in elementary school in Orange, New Jersey. So I kind of have that where I, both that perspective where I see both as a student and as a teacher how we can affirm um, students' identities. I think the most important thing while, while I was a student, especially at a Catholic university, I needed to find my kind of group of people that I felt affirm my identity and then that helped me feel more empowered to, to to say something if I was in a class and I felt like a professor wasn't affirming another person's identity or wasn't affirming my own. Um, I think as a teacher I kind of see it in like a in multiple ways so I want to affirm the identities because we have like some parents that are part of the LGBTQ community so I want to make sure that I'm affirming those identities by not saying mom and dad, but instead parents or guardians, instead um, um, using more inclusive language. And then in more curriculum wise, looking at how we can involve different histories, LGBTQ histories, because LGBTQ history is American history. So we can involve that in the um, I also think that 
because I have LGBTQ um, students, whether they're out or not, I want to make sure that I'm creating a safe space and I'm making sure that I'm I'm not when if I hear something that is not appropriate, if I hear something that is not affirming an identity, I make that a conversation instead of shying away from it. Where I felt like when I was growing up, that wasn't even it was just like well man, woman, that's it. Like, and, and now I definitely see the, the new crop of teachers that are more willing to even have the conversation, if, even if it's uncomfortable for them. So that, that's what I think. And when you say that, you're saying that even in an, you're, you said you teach at elementary school? Yeah, and I so think you can still have those conversations. In the yeah. elementary school. Yeah, I think you could still have those conversations. Obviously, it's not going to be at the same level as in high school or college, but I think you can still have those conversations as we are all people. And even though these certain people have different ways of life, certain people have different identities, we can all accept them and we can all learn more about each other. Thank you. So, Patleen, I'd like to uh, uh, ask you for your opinion about this question. How can teachers and administrators support school children and adolescents? Uh, and gender expression and identity, and how can curriculums be more inclusive? Um, I think that Amber uh, definitely broke it down very well for us, you know, being seeing both parts. But I think another thing that we can uh, try to do is all about um, like the history of LGBTQ community, because I feel as though just like we have bought in black history or like, you know, white history or whatever it may be, the more you learn about things, the easier it is to understand them and the easier it is to keep an open mind about certain things. So I feel like education is key in, you know, helping people accept other people. So as long as teachers are doing their part and like bringing it up, just like Amber said, it's, you're not too young to learn about it. You're not too young to know that you should accept everyone. You're not too young to, you know, um, just be open minded about certain things, you know. But as long as the teachers keep in mind, you know, we should teach them these things, we should keep like the education broad, then I feel like as though it's going to help regardless because as a youngin, they're more willing to take it in. So as a youngin, <laughs> they're more willing to like accept things. It's easier to go through one ear and like sit and like that they can digest it. But and it's a little harder once you start growing up and then especially if like comment like whatever your background is, it's a little harder to like get that. But once if a teacher is there to like get that in their head at a young age, it's easier to accept it as they grow up and then learn about it and then see the different perspectives and such. Thank you. Elizabeth, would you like to chime in on that question? Uh, sure. I think when it comes to creating a safe space within the education system, we've only just started making strides. So there's so much more that we have to continue doing. There's still issues with like gender neutral bathrooms and things like that within younger spaces because a lot of people like to argue that it's a safety hazard or some other reason, you know, shouldn't be used against LGBTQ students. So things like this, we do have to shine more of a light on because I feel like there's a lot of attention going towards having kind of committees. There's a lot of attention going towards having seminars, but there's still a lot of action that's not being taken. Well, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, I, my daughter and I had a similar discussion and you almost exactly copied the words out of her mouth. <laughs> she said she's tired of having meetings and discussions. She wants action. Yes. Jalen, would you like to uh, say something? You're shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I definitely I love everything that everyone has said so far, actually, and I definitely agree with everything, especially uh, with Elizabeth. I'm tired of having, you know, I'm tired of just talking. Let's do something. You know, you can't just continuously talk, 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 talk. Eventually, at some point, that talking has to lead to something further. It just has to. Um, so uh, similar to Amber, I'm actually, I'm not a teacher yet. I'm a senior student teacher um, in elementary. 
And I feel that like these discussions definitely should be had in like elementary school. If anything, I think it's a little more vital to start them earlier. Um, you know, it, by the time students come to like kindergarten or they're any school age, they're at the school age, they are being cognizant of like their gender. Um, they have crushes on kids. When you have, when you're like in, you know, second grade, you have a crush on somebody. It's nothing more than a, oh, you know, this person's really nice, and you know, I want to hold their hand or something like that. I don't understand what's wrong with that when it's anything other than the traditional one little boy, one little girl. Why, why is there a problem with it? I, th I feel like people try to make it a lot more make it a lot more like adult than it's supposed to be when it's anything outside of the ordinary, anything outside of the binary. And I feel like, you know, addressing that and telling people that, hey, this is a problem because you are forcing, you are literally forcing something onto children that nobody else is trying to, that's an issue. Um, you know, so even going back to like um, gender, some kids might be exploring a bunch of different things when they're like in, you know, kindergarten or something. I know for myself growing up, I never really questioned my gender, but I questioned a lot of things um, that weren't traditional for like boys to do. I grew up, I loved the Cheetah Girls when the Cheetah Girls came out. You know, I had my mom buy me the VCR. I watched it all the time, period, period. I watched it all the time. To this day, I still, I'll, I'll watch it a few times a year, still listen to the music. Um, but that's not something that was traditional for, you know, I guess like five-year-old boys to do. I was supposed to be, you know, maybe watching some other like sport. I was supposed to be watching some sport, which is totally okay. I just was never really not really into any sports and stuff like that. But I think, you know, growing up without having, you know, these conversations or people who made me feel like it's okay to kind of be different outside of whatever society has told you is supposed to be normal. Without those conversations, it really affected me in terms of like, do I, should I not engage in these things? Should I not feel like this way? Am I wrong for feeling this way? And if we want to continue having kids feel like that as we go on, I don't understand what the point of society is at this point. I feel like we sh we should be progressing. We should be progressing, and we shouldn't want our kids to grow up. It's it shouldn't be normal for kids to grow up with so much self hatred. It shouldn't be. So I think that's part of the reason why I got into education because I just I think about how I used to feel when I was in school. I would never ever want any student in my classroom, any student that I ever come across, to ever feel the way that I did at that point. Very good point. So how do we undo gender? How do we undo the binary in educational spaces? Do, for instance, in your institutions, are, are, is, there, is there conversation around language? Is there conversation around pronoun use? Do those kinds of conversations take place? And Elizabeth, I'll start with you. Um, I'm very glad that you asked this question because I myself am non-binary. I use they, them pronouns. And it's, posed itself as a problem in the professional world, but I'm glad to see that the younger generation is more understanding of people's gender identities. There's a lot of people who don't want to accept the possibility that someone can be non-binary because the concept of there being two genders is so deeply ingrained into people's psyche that it's hard to switch that over. But the one thing that has to be offered, regardless of if you can understand or not, is respect. That respect is using the pronouns that someone chooses to identify with. That respect is not saying hurtful things like there are only two genders, because that's scientifically been proven wrong to begin with, but I feel like as the adults in the situation, it can't just be up to the younger generation to be that understanding because we are the ones that are currently kind of in the seat of like leading this country and we're the ones that have to keep up that responsibility of offering everyone that respect regardless of how they identify. Jalen? I'm sorry, could you just repeat the question one more time so I make sure I address it? You know, how do you, how do you undo gender in the in the institutional settings that you're in? And it's really interesting that you were in 
you know, you're in, in advanced educational settings and you're also in settings where you're trying to teach young children. So I think it's really interesting your perspectives. So how do you undo gender and how does language play in, in, in on that and, and the idea of busting the binary? Unfortunately, I think it, it's, it's going to be such a long process, such a long process, because I, I agree. I, I think that we are making strides as a as a society. I think we are making strides, but I just don't think they're far enough. Like it's kind of like little by little by little, and similar to like what was addressed before. You like little things can only they only go for go so far. Like at some point, everyone's going to be tired of just the little things. Let's let's move forward. Come on, we've been doing this for a while. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a long a long process. But you know, starting in the classroom, at least for myself. Uh, similar to like what Amber mentioned at the beginning, you know, trying to use gender inclusive language or non gendered language where you're just addressing people who are caregivers instead of parents, your guardians instead of parents, because some people don't even live with parents, whether their parents are, you know, two men, two women, a, ma a male and a female, whatever it may be. So I think feel like caregivers is, you know, one way to kind of like address that. And then in the classroom itself, the traditional idea of anything that's boys versus girls, or let's split up the boys into one group, let's split up the girls into one group. That's a problem. That's incredibly problematic for so many reasons. Like, what about a student who doesn't, you know, identify as a boy nor girl? Where, where are you going to set them? You can't, it'd be disrespectful to, for you as the teacher to set them into a position that you feel they're supposed to identify with when they themselves don't identify with that. Or there might just be, you know, some girls who don't feel comfortable or in that circle. Some boys who don't feel comfortable in that circle, like breaking this idea of everything has to be so black or white or binary. That's I, that's going to be a long process, but I think with everyone who's you know trying to make strides in education within the community themselves, trying to educate those around them, I think it's going to be a process that we can eventually break. I just think it's going to take a while. Amber, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think I definitely think that uh, I love what Elizabeth said that we shouldn't put the onus on people that are in that community to make the strides for them. And that's why we need allies. That's why we need people to support them and to to be the ones to say, even if, if someone doesn't want to to, I don't know, like clap back or something <laughs> like, like if they don't want to do that, we need to have allies in the back that are ready to do that for them. Um, so. I think that especially in in the space that I'm in, I try to be super, super cognizant of how people are feeling and try to come at it at that level. So then it doesn't even, for, for people that are, especially kids, they, they don't exactly know why something they said might be offensive or why something they said might be problematic because it's learned from their families, from their society. Um, so we come at it as a conversation of, how do you think this person felt instead of blaming it and, and making it kind of like an antagonistic thing? Um, I think that works too, um, but it's different when you're talking to adults that have had this conversation that have been told over and over again and simply don't care. I think it's just simply a, a thing of, of keep fighting and, and we hope for the best. Um, but definitely starting with the kids, if that generation um, works, to being more inclusive works to actually caring up pe about people's feelings and identities and, and works toward learning about different cultures and learning about different identities, then in 20 years, we won't have those same problems. So it's it's, it's a waiting game, unfortunately, but I, I definitely agree with what um, Lizbeth said that we want to make sure that we have allies and that we're um, standing up for people that might not feel comfortable to, to do it for themselves. Pat Lane, would you like to comment before we move on to our next topic? Um, I feel like everybody pretty much covered everything, but I guess like the only thing I would add is that um, in, re in reference to allies, because parents are not the only people who have influence over their children, um, there's like the professors, teachers, you know, everybody that they go around. We want to have as many of those people educated enough so that when children come into their plate in their places that they are able to you know do whatever they can to help break that because yes it's going to take a long time yes you know strides may be short or long but if everybody's doing their part in a sense and you know the type of influence you have over the younger generation 
then it helps to, you know, make bigger strides and have like more influence. Along with that, you, we have social media nowadays. So, you know, with what we're posting, the people we see, the talks that we have using social media, all those things can help to make bigger advances and help this, you know, trial take long, uh, less time than it needs to. Thank you, thank you. Those were all great answers. And so, um, since I, I'm, you know, we've I've heard the word family and allies. I think this would be a good time to move our discussion into talking about uh, families and the influence of families on on uh, gender independent people and the whole idea of LGBTQ acceptance in families. And uh, along with allyship, right? I think for most of us, we think our greatest allies are our mom and dad, right? Or our, our parents, whoever those parents are, like Jalen was saying, the caregivers, the people who, who raise you. And, and, you know, and sometimes in black and brown families, it's an extended family. It's not just the immediate family. And so uh, talk about a little bit your experiences and your, in terms of the culture in your family uh, as as young people who were you know coming up trying to figure things out like all of us uh, and and get to your authentic self and and having the courage and the bravery to live as your authentic selves within your families and what that was like and so I'll start with uh, Pat Lean. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um. Okay. Where do I start? Um, first of all, I grew up in a Haitian Christian household. I don't know how strict it can get from that, but yeah. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> but um, honestly, as funny as it's about to sound, I actually didn't find myself until I got to college. Yes, this Catholic Institute. Mm -hmm. This is where I realized like, hey, mm, maybe we're not all the way gonna fit into the heterosexual community. <laughs> And uh, from there, I kind of just had to, first of all, like accept myself, learn myself, and then be able to, you know, actually go up against my parents and be like, hey, look, I'm about to kind of deviate from the way you were teaching me real quick, and I'm going to catch you on the flip side. Um, family support, it's more so, I don't even think it's support at this point, it's more so if you don't talk about it, we won't talk about it, and then we could just keep living as is. And I think for most people, I would hope for most people, it's like that. Um, it's not like a, a talk subject, especially if you grew up in a household where religion is a big thing. So you kind of have to work your way around it, kind of finesse it essentially. And, you know, I guess one thing for me was the fact that I had to make a decision of saying, look, I understand what I've been brought up on, but at the same time, I'm going to have to choose my own happiness, you know? I'm going to have to choose what makes me feel comfortable. And up until this year, honestly, I did not take the time to sit down and think about what would make me happy in perspective to this. So I'm still, still uh, trying to figure myself Um, I'm still trying to learn. I'm still trying to talk to understand but for the most part I wouldn't say like my family was an ally they were more so like obstacles that I had to conquer in a sense and obstacles that I had to find a way around so um I guess what I'm trying to say is that even if you don't have that allyship with it with your uh family or with extended family especially if you're in a Christian household you have to find a way to make sure that you're okay and you have to find a way to make sure that you're going to live your own truth and that like no matter what other people say no matter what they are that's not their life it's your own life so you just have to figure out a way to work with that work through that and as I said before finesse that because that's really what it is because I remember when I told my mom like listen I might like girls she very much was like yeah I'm gonna go pray for you now and I'm looking at her like you know what you could have said some words but I'll take this. Go go talk to Jesus. How about that? <laughs> and I'll just keep, you know, pushing it because that's really how it is. And I think for like majority of like Christian household or black household, it's not something that they want to talk about. It's not something that they are proud of in a sense. Um, for most of the time when like their child come out or like, you know, let them know this is what they are. This is what it is. But at the same time, I just feel like 
over time, you learn how to maneuver your way around it. And at this point, that's really how it is. But if anybody has other tips on how, I mean, maybe I'll just go pray about it too. But, you know, <laughs> just happy and that's just how it is. Amber, would you like to chime in on that one? Um, I don't I don't think I have anything to add for this one. But thank you, Patlene. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Elizabeth? Um, so I can kind of relate because I came from a half Muslim, half half Catholic household. So they really weren't messing with the whole concept of me not fitting their idea of a perfect quote unquote daughter. But I think I got back with them because I did come out twice. I came out as a lesbian at first and then I came out as non-binary. So they had to deal with both of those and they definitely weren't prepared, especially seeing as both of these religions are very man marrying a woman is the household that you should aspire to have. So this just threw the whole the whole plot in the garbage. Um, <laughs> I think the way that people that come from these religious backgrounds, though, the way that they can handle this is showing that they are still representative of their faith, regardless of what their sexuality or gender is. There's a lot of things within the Bible that has supported um, non-binary existence, that has supported whatever they're trying to say is evil. Um, everyone knows how the Bible quote, man shall not lay with man, is actually not the direct translation. The direct translation is man shall not lay with boy, speaking towards the pedophilia that was going on. But that was turned into a hate for anyone who is not straight anyone who's part of the lgbt community it's become this target on their back and using that that specific quote so you kind of have to do your own research and kind of prove it that we do have a history in all of these religions we have placements in so many histories not only just religiously we have placements in planetary descriptions. The planet of Mercury is considered androgynous, whereas the other planets have feminine or masculine. There's places that we have been this entire time that we've been erased from. The LGBT community has been erased from, from history. So it's our job to kind of like pull it back and say, no, just because my gender is not something that you are used to or my sexuality is not something that you're used to that doesn't change the fact that I can still practice our faith that I can still be a member of this family if that makes sense it does I am a deacon in my church uh, unity fellowship church movement and we are an affirming congregation and so we deal with a lot of the issues that you talk about when people experience what we call church hurt, right? You get you, you get hurt in the in religious spaces because you're you're listening to people who are giving you this message from the pulpit. And these are people that you you know you're raised to honor and respect, you know, that's that that there's a you know problem between you and God because of all these uh, man's interpretations of language, which is incorrect. And uh, Elizabeth, I see you are definitely a scholar and very good for you. <laughs> um, and uh, like the word homosexual does not even exist in the Bible. It, just, it, it isn't in there. there. You could try to find it all you want to, it's not in there. And so, you know, we grew up in this puritanical structure and, you know, religion was not only used, it was used to indoctrinate people, it was used to control people, it was used to manipulate people. It wasn't just about people's spiritual growth. And of course, it's very patriarchal, it's very male. There are times when women weren't even allowed in the pulpit uh, until recently. They weren't allowed to, you know, reach the, the level of being a reverend or a minister or, and so the church has uh, quite a lot of undoing. And it's interesting because you, you're, you're in a Catholic institution. So that must be uh, um, 
quite challenging. Uh, Jalen, would you like to comment on this before we move on? Yeah, so um, I mean, my households weren't very religious. Um, I, my mom's household was a black household. My dad's household was a Dominican, Peruvian, Puerto Rican household. Um, and I never really came out to my family just because I never felt it was necessary. Um, you know, up until I never really accepted myself until like freshman year of college. It was like one of the first days and I met somebody and um, I was just like, you know what, let me, I get, it's a new start, it's a fresh start. I don't know anybody here. What's the worst that could happen? Um, and it felt really good just to tell, you know, you know to tell somebody. Um, but to my family, af after that point, I never felt a need to, you know, sit them down, tell them anything just because, you know, none of my siblings ever had to sit them down and say, hey, I have a girlfriend. You know, none of my brothers had to do that. My sister never had to say, oh, I like boys. So I never thought that that was a necessary thing. Um, but then also, I mean, I, I consider myself to have the privilege of being able to choose my family um, because I just have such a big, you know, I have so many relatives. You know, I have four younger siblings. I have 11 grandparents. So I have more than enough to go around, you know. Um, so I don't really affiliate everyone who's a relative to, you know, one of my parents or a relative to myself. I don't consider them to be my family necessarily. Like if you're my family, that means, you know, I trust you. I love you. We've gone through some stuff together and I feel like I can, you know, speak to you about anything and likewise. Um, otherwise though, you, you are just like my mom's cousin. We're not family. I don't, you know, we don't, I don't have any ill will towards you, but we don't have any connection like that. Like we don't have to kick it like that. Um, so when it comes to my family, I am comfortable speaking to them about anything they want to address. Um, it's kind of similar to Pat Lee's situation where it's like a, you don't say anything, I don't say anything, but I feel like it's not really in a, in a bad way. It's just kind of like, it never comes up in conversation. The one, one of my parents, like my mom, I've gone to pride with her. So that was probably like the biggest thing ever, honestly, um, <laughs> just because, you know, it never, we never had to have a conversation prior to that where she was like, Hey, are you? And then, okay, so let's go to Pride. It was just kind of like, oh, you know, me and your aunt, we're going to be going. Do you want to come? <laughs> right, Pauline, right. Um, she was just like, oh, we're going to go to Pride. Do you want to come? You want to bring a friend or whatever? And that's how it was. Um, so, you know, I'm super grateful for like my relationship with her, um, but kind of with like the rest of my family, it's kind of a, we don't have to talk about it because why? If I bring somebody home someday, I'll bring somebody home. And if your jaw is dropped, then you can keep it pushing. Well, that's that's wonderful. I'm glad you're empowered. Um, but, you know, from the work of the Newark LGBTQ Center, uh, we see a lot of the opposite, I guess, is my experience. Um, you know, young people are rejected by their families and wind up uh, dispelled from their homes. And then we you know, you go through this awful cycle of homelessness and and and, uh, you know, high risks of just about everything. And uh, a lot of it ha is rooted in sometimes the religious beliefs of the family and um, the cultural beliefs of the family. And so, um, you know, it's something I think you just need to be aware of. Your experiences are, are good, healthy experiences, thank God. Um, but the majority, uh, I won't say the majority, but a great number of young people, unfortunately, uh, have the opposite experience and wind up um, uh, homeless because of, the, of the, the family rejection. And that, that can occur as young as 14, 15, 16 years of age. Uh, do you find that in your your own social circles with other students and stuff like that, that, that have, do you encounter other, other students that have that experience where their families have just outright rejected them because of their being non-binary or because they've identify, identified as queer or LGBTQ? So I'm not hearing anything. So I think is that mean no? <laughs> really? Well, that's good. We need you to go out and train some more family members and stuff so we can keep our young people <laughs> safe at home. Uh, so let's talk about um, how COVID has impacted you in 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 your life and experience as students and teachers. Um, the pandemic has, it's almost a year in now. It is, I know from my experience, it has drastically reduced people's ability to socialize 
and LGBTQ folks like to socialize because I know I do. And so I, I miss being able to gather together, to, to be with folks like me, to laugh and joke and talk, you know, to be around like-minded, authentic people is, 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 you know, good for the spirit and good for the soul. And so now we are isolated in ways that uh, we, we've never experienced. And so how are you finding community in the process of dealing with COVID pandemic? And Amber, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, definitely. In, in the beginning of the pandemic, I was a senior. So I was graduating and taking all my last classes. So it was definitely um, like a shock of realizing like we're not going to have a graduation as soon as I thought and we're not going to have like all like my family was going to come and my family didn't come and then going from living in a dorm with all my friends are right there to now being like an hour away from where all my friends are and just like seeing the same three people every day <laughs> like it was it, it definitely was a shock to me um I think now luckily I, I moved out of my parents house and I live with one of my best friends so that has been really good for me. I don't think, I don't know how I would be able to function if I was living by myself, but it's definitely a weird thing starting a new job. And I interact with all these people every day, but it's always through the screen. <laughs> and I, I see the same, like I have a, a nice scenery, <laughs> luckily, but I, I see the, the same people every day, but I haven't like seen, seen them in person. Um, so I think it's definitely, different in that like even if you look at like the first year teacher blogs it, there nothing prepared us for this um and for my kids I can't even like I don't they've never met me ever for a year or probably going to be virtual for the rest of this year too so it's 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 definitely a weird um time trying to make the best of it and my kids are I, I think at first they thought that because it was about to be over they were kind of like slacking but you can see that when especially when they're in school especially for my kids that don't have the best home lives like being in school even virtually is one of the best times for them um so I'm glad that I'm able to be part of that experience Jalen would you like to comment yeah so for me um being home it, it was weird because, I mean, I already usually don't see all my family during the school year because I live in an apartment off campus. Um, but then, you know, being quarantined, I was kind of just staying with one family for the most part. So I didn't really get to see like my dad and stuff all that much. Um, and like you had mentioned before, I love to socialize. However, I like to so socialize with very few, like my select group of people. So I'm not very open to meeting new people all the time because I, I just kind of like, I don't trust you as soon as I meet you. Um, so I have like, you know, I, I let all my professors know, especially within like my education program. I have a good four people who I'm like, oh yeah, I trust them. I trust them. So, you know, we can work together. Everybody else, again, no ill will, but it's not a, you know, I'm not about to like, hey, do you want to go hang out kind of thing. Um, so not being able to see like my, my regular people that I like, um, it, it was, it was hard. It was tough. You know, we had to eventually like use basically like Microsoft Teams just to like talk <laughs> like just to be like, oh, hey, I forgot what you looked like kind of thing. And then some people we kind of stayed on Microsoft Teams actually from like 11 a.m. to like three in the morning, which was probably a problem. It's probably an issue. Um, but that was kind of the way I had to deal with it, um, you know, and then, you know, I, I noticed that it definitely affected me coming back to school um, just because there was so much time, obviously, to kind of like reflect on myself on a bunch of different things, who I am, who do I want to be? Um, so by the time I started school up again, I realized I was, I mean, I'm still like a lot more sheltered than I think I was previously. Um, so even with like meeting professors and stuff or seeing professors again, I'm really not that open about everything. Cause you know, obviously we've all been through something over this entire time, like this past year. Um, so there's certain things that I just kind of don't want to open up and share. Cause it's, if, if I tell you, it doesn't really make me feel any better. And I know you can't do anything about it. So why are we going to kind of like waste the breath on that kind of thing? Um, so I feel like a lot of people, I, I haven't, no one's told me, but it's kind of like I, I can read the room. I feel like I'm probably being a lot more sheltered than I used to be, or Jalen's not as talkative as he used to be. Um, but I'm kind of just, I'm trying to, lack of a better word, I'm trying to get past the BS. I don't want to do that anymore. Um, so I'm, 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 I've, it's been tough. It's been tough trying to like not being able to socialize and stuff, but I've made it work. Okay. Elizabeth? I feel like during um, 
quarantine and when it all started and up until now, the teens in the LGBT community and people our age have definitely had a boost of confidence because everything had to be transported to social media, being online. And lo and behold, that is exactly where LGBT youth loves to hang out. So Mm -hmm. being able to communicate with other LGBTQ members from across the country or finding other trans people, finding people that understand my situation, kind of having a chosen family, as a lot of people like to call it, has definitely helped. And I feel like that's not just something that I would say. I feel like that's something that a lot of people can speak to within what we've all experienced during this quarantine, during coronavirus. Also, if you're ever looking for a support group, there is an LGBTQ organization that I am vice president of called True Pride. We have meetings bi-weekly, so if you're interested in finding that community, just follow our Instagram. It's at Shoe Pride. And Shoe Pride is is uh, uh, an uh, an authorized student organization. Yes, we got our authorization, I believe, two and a half years ago to function officially on Seton Hall's campus. So sounds like is Seton Hall, would you say Seton Hall is a progressive uh, environment for, for these kinds of issues? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth? I'm going to get back to you on that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is a Catholic private institution. Um, don't right. they that, that has to be usual navigation for you. Uh, yeah. Though they accepted us as an organization, it did take a lot of pushback, an extreme amount of pushback. So it's hard to say if they allowed us to become an organization to please the students or if they are actually moving in that progressive direction. But of course, knowledge comes with time, so we shall see. Fenton, would you like to add to this part of the discussion before we move on to our next subject? Um, I guess like, just like everybody is just more so getting adjusted to everything because, you know, I also like hanging out with people. I mean, granted, hanging out was just us getting food, but it was just like something about having other people around and like laughing and all that. That was cute. Um, when COVID started, I had to go home. It was, it just felt like I was being torn away from my second family, and I was just like, damn. But, um, you know, we got readjusted. The school life, it sucks. But, you know, I feel like there's ways to work around everything, and there's way, ways to work through everything. And that's honestly like what I've been going with is just just make it through another week, make it through another week. And I don't know if that's like good or bad, but at this point it's getting me through. So we just gonna keep repeating that for ourselves. And um, I think another thing with uh, COVID is like Liz said, is that you get to meet people that you wouldn't normally meet around you like online, like from God knows where. And it's just like you connect for some reason because it's like you can understand each other and such and I am grateful for that and yeah but um I think Jalen dropped in the chat like how some people like their home wasn't really their home and I feel like I I'm not saying like my home wasn't really my home because I love being in my house especially when my mother cooks chef's kiss but at the same time there were like other aspects that I was just like especially when it came to like me being comfortable with myself it, you kind of had to like hide away, like present what you had to present, but hide away what you had to hide away just so you don't, you know, trigger her or anything. And I feel like with COVID, it was a little hard to like be myself in that in the household, like all the way, because it was just like she, she was checking on me as a mother, but at the same time, I felt like she was just suffocating me. And I'm like, please leave me alone. So all of that. Um, I, I said all of that just to say that now I'm back on campus and I just feel like free in a way, like finally just being happy with doing what I want and being who I want. 
and just finally finding a way to like I don't know like grow in a sense and understand myself so I guess COVID has had its ups and downs but you know as long as you figure out a way it's all about finesse y'all just finesse and then you got this (laughs) (laughs) so uh, um are, are you having discussions amongst the students and your families about the vaccine and and the responsibilities that people may or may not have in terms of them feeling they should have the vaccine and get the vaccine and what that would mean to your community i mean you all like you know have older people around you in some ways um you know as in roles as uh teachers i guess i would consider you an essential worker right and so how is that playing out for you in terms of getting access to the vaccine? Are you having discussions in, in your professions or amongst your families and students about uh, getting the vaccine? Amber, would you like to comment? Yeah, um, actually, so I live in Newark um, and Essex County has been kind of like a shut down, closed door on <laughs> vaccines. Um, so even though we're it, we're it's in the one B category as a, as a teacher, so I am considered an essential worker. But because I live in Essex County, where a majority of Black and Brown people live, there there's not access to vaccines. So I actually was able to I scour the internet and I'm I have the first dose. I'm going to get the second dose next month, but I had to get it outside of Essex County. Um, mm. So I had to. So in talking with my family, it they know it's very important and they have my grandmother lives with them so they understand the importance of that and um even talking with like my kids in the class because they want to go back to school so they're trying to figure out like what's the next step like how are we going <laughs> to how are we going to do this so and what and when we were talking about the vaccine so then they're talking about it with their families like oh are you getting vaccinated like what list or what um category are you in in the the vaccine plan so it's definitely conversations that we're having and I think for the kids, it's more selfish because they want to go back to school, but they'll go back in the school buildings. Um, but the, the conversations are definitely happening. Jalen? Hold on. Hey, Beatrice. This I'm is Anna. I'm so sorry. I have a question from the audience. Um, so okay. I just wanted to throw that out there since we have a couple of minutes left on the panel. But the question to the panelists is, how do you, what advice do you have for someone that's still on their journey of self-acceptance that might be struggling? Who would like to take that question? Can I speak on that? Sure you can. (laughs) I think the biggest thing that I would suggest is you don't have to label anything. You don't have to rush to put a label on yourself. If you're still trying to discover yourself, you don't have to describe yourself by saying, oh, I'm bisexual, I'm um, gender fluid. Don't rush to label yourself. It will come much easier to you and your identity will become much more clearer to you when you stop trying to fit in so many boxes and so many labels. Jalen, would you like to speak on that? Yeah, um, I would suggest, you know, Every once in a while, you got to be selfish or and, and or not care about what anybody else thinks. Like, don't feel kind of to add on to like what Elizabeth said. Don't feel like you have to rush to put a label on something, especially if you feel like, you know, society is telling you you have to or like people around you are telling you you have to. At the end of the day, they don't they don't wake up and go to sleep as you. You do. So, you know, just do whatever makes you comfortable. Move at your own pace. That's one of the the times where I would say, you know, moving at a slow pace, those, you know, slow struts, that, that's totally fine. It's totally up to you. Um, it, it's in your hands. Nobody else's. And uh, Pat Lane? Um, I have to agree with Liz heavy on the no label thing, because as a person who's still trying to find herself and still mm, struggling in a sense, I think that's important because I feel like once you put a label on yourself, you feel as though as much as stereotypes, you know, we don't really like it because of the bad connotation. You feel as though you have to follow said stereotypes that come with that said label. And if you start labeling yourself and you don't, you know, fit into that category per per se, um, it kind of makes it more even more difficult to accept yourself and more difficult to understand understand yourself. So I feel like 
labeling, just wait. Because, again, if you're going to be part of the community, that's one, I feel like that's one thing that is lovely about it is that you don't have to abide by any types of rules. You do what you want. You just live for who you are. So there's no reason for you to, like, you know, be struggling. I feel like another thing, as a psych major, I would say is um, learn to understand and feel your emotions or learn to understand and feel your feelings because that's a big thing about it. Um, With me, like, part of my struggle is that I try to be numb to a lot of things. And at the end of the day, it's going to bottle you, like, it's going to, like, add on and till the point where it bursts and you don't want that to happen to you so i feel like just take it slow accept anything you're feeling and just kind of like work through it if you need to talk about it i feel like that's a major thing too talk about it with somebody that you trust because then it helps you pinpoint exactly like where you're at and then you know i feel like research is another big thing look through stuff be like okay so what describes a person as a bisexual or what what describes a person as a lesbian? Whatever, you know, whatever you have to do, just make sure you look into it and weigh all options. And then if at the end of the day you don't find a label that describes you, be like me. What's your label, Pat? I'm Pat. What you mean? Like, it's so simple. <laughs> just, you know, it is a struggle, but at the same time, just take it at your, at your own pace. And I feel like there's a lot of stress that can be relieved from that. I, uh, from my experience, um, you know, we, you know, I, I came out, I guess, in my mid thirties, I wouldn't have dared had this conversation with anyone when I was you guys age. <laughs> so I'm glad you're able, I, it, it just makes my heart like filled with joy. The fact that you, you, as young as you are, I found affirming uh, communities and affirming of each other and that you were, you know, really kind of in- emotionally intelligent enough to kind of navigate the kinds of things that you have to navigate, uh, you know, but because our whole society is built on, you know, these dichotomies of these normatives, male, female, it's this or it's that. If you're not this, you're the other, um, you know, that was kind of, of my experience, um, and um, I can really relate to what Patleen said about just be you, just be who you are. And and it is true. Don't don't be. It, it takes a long time sometimes for you to discover your complete and total authentic self. You know, we 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 don't know everything at seventeen and eighteen. We don't know. We you don't know what you want to do with your life. You may not want to know what religion you want to practice. You may not want to know what you want to eat. You know, and so now these little things like this. Now you want me to know everything about my sexuality and my gender and my identity, which is one of the most complex parts of human existence, right? And so, right, slow down. You know, don't be hard on yourself. Um, you know, it, it, you'll figure it out. You'll, you'll find community. You know, the, the biggest thing is to make sure that you, you, you know, you choose your spaces as safe spaces, affirming spaces, and, you know, don't find yourself or put yourself in situations where you're not having your, your, your spirit fed with, you know, with love and justice and, and freedom and, and acknowledgement and being seen for who you are. And those those are the kind of spaces that we really need to work on um, because, you know, they're kind of everywhere. Right. They're they're in, in jobs, they're in your school, they're they may be in your home. Um, and so um, I really like the fact that that what you're saying is just so true. Just just just, you know, give it some time, let it flow and uh, it'll it'll come to you. And, and it's a you know, it's a different world. People are a lot more open about these conversations now. Um, and so you, you don't have to isolate, you know, you guys have kicked the closet door off the hinge, <laughs> never to be put back, which is a wonderful thing. I love it. I absolutely love it. So now how do you kick the closet door off of your, your, your institutions of education? Um, how, what policies are, or do you see things like that going on? Are your, are, is there a, a focus on administratively, uh, to really kind of grapple with these issues? in educational settings. In New Jersey, for example, there's an LGBTQ curriculum now, right? 
Um, you know, but how how effective is that curriculum? You know, is it really inclusive? Do we still need a lot of work to be done in that particular area? Amber, I think because you're your teacher, I want I want to ask you about that. Yeah, I actually, so I did a lot of work with um, NJEA, the the um, labor organization for New Jersey, um, when they lobbied to get that passed last year, and I was so super excited when it was passed. Um, but in the same vein, we have the Amistad Act that was passed um, 18 years ago now, which in, says that we have to include black history in New Jersey's public schools. And still, in, I was in the New Jersey public school in the last 18 years, and all you learned about is Martin Luther King, maybe a Rosa Parks, maybe a Harriet Tubman. So I think because it's a state law, and there's not really like real parameters about it. It really just, the language really just says that we need to include some form of LGBTQ history. Does that mean just say it's Pride Month and then move on? Does that mean talk about Marsha or, and move on? Like, what does that mean? So I, it, I think it's really up to the parents in the district. It's really up to the teachers to make that decision. It's really up to the teacher preparation programs to include um, histories of LGBTQ stories. So we're learning about Marsha, we're learning about Sylvia, we're learning about Stonewall, we're doing all of that work. So then when we're in the field, we have more um, concrete tools to use and you don't have to go out on your own and, and kind of find them for yourself. Jaden, would you like to chime in? Yeah, I feel like um, regardless of the institution, on the administrative level, it's nothing's really gonna move. Like kind of like what Amber said, like you got to get like the the parents, the guardians in it to start pushing for that. So even like at like the university, at our university, the students have to kind of start, you know, you have to start pushing for what you want. And like it does get annoying on like all levels. It does get annoying because it sometimes feel like so certain people are always at the forefront. Certain people always feel like they have to um, push for something. I feel like within our community, that's kind of how like, <laughs> you know, we are. We have to push for just basic humanity. Um, but Ultimately, I think that's how things get done, essentially. No one on the top part, regardless of what law is passed, they're never really going to you know, adhere to that until people put pressure on them to do that. You have to have a put pressure. You have to like make them say, you know, we want this visibility. It says that you have to do this. So why aren't you, you know, why aren't you doing that? Hold them accountable for that. Um, yeah, just continue pushing pressure on. That's that's what I would say. Do, do you think parents um, of the students who are as you having to incorporate LGBTQ history into your classrooms, you, do you do you anticipate the parents being an issue? The parents being an issue with like that history the, being the, right, that history being taught to their children and yeah. the curriculum being presented. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Most definitely. I mean, you saw in Utah, now they want to take Black history out of the curriculum. So. Come on. <laughs> Doesn't mean I, we're not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's going to be like a never ending struggle. You know, you're never going to make everybody happy, but people need to be recognized. People need to be acknowledged. People need to be seen. People need to be heard. So keep putting pressure on it until, you know, until you, we basically got to just keep putting pressure on it forever. So I think we probably need to, in, in the course of doing these curriculum changes and stuff, we probably need to have more opportunities to have dialogues with parents, um, you know, because, you know, you can anticipate some pushback, uh, but we need to develop language and around what is a good discourse and dialogue around trying to make them understand. It's like you said, LGBTQ is Amer uh, history is American history. Black history is American history. We are all connected. You know, we've all been in each other's spaces. We've been in each other's churches. We've been in each other's institutions. We've been in each other's families, sharing this whole world for a long, long time. Uh, uh, you know, we've just, you know, we, it hasn't been a climate where we've been able to really openly and honestly deal with these things. And so um, I really appreciate the fact that we are raising some wonderful young leaders who hopefully will go out there and flip all of this on its head. <laughs> and so now um, let's talk about resources. So if you're an LGBT person in your in your university, if you're an LGBT person, Q person in the school systems that you're teaching, what kind of resources are available there to help uh, families, to help students um, who are navigating some of these issues? Elizabeth? As Shu Pride leader, is uh, would you like to respond to that? So, as for resources, Shu Pride will always be here. We have connections to people who work for 
the Trevor Project. We also have connections to a lot of nonprofits that support LGBTQ communities. As for Seton Hall, we're still fighting to get a couple more resources. There is <laughs> a problematic resource that they have where it's kind of described as learning how to cope with your sexuality that's offered by Seton Hall. And when they say cope, we can kind of assume what they mean through a Catholic perspective. Um, so we're still fighting for that. But if you are a student on campus, True Pride will always be here to fight for all LGBTQ students and to keep you guys in mind while they still figure out how to do that themselves. Uh, Pantene, would you like to chime in? Petleen, before you uh, chime in, I'm so I'm so sorry, Petleen. I'm yeah, gonna. Uh, I just wanted to add on to what Lizbeth said. We dropped the Trevor Project resources into the chat box for anyone who needs them, and then we also dropped um, Shoe Pride's Instagram handle so that anyone here on this call uh, can follow them, and then you can also download any of the Trevor Project resources. Okay, thank you, Patlene. Um, to be honest, I really don't have any resources. I could give myself up if you want to talk. Yeah, but uh, honestly, I can like Google. I don't know. I really don't know. Cause I'm for my for me, like if y'all have any resources, I greatly appreciate them. Cause I'm still, you know, struggling with all that. But if you guys do have any resources that needs help, I offer myself also. Jalen? I think probably one of the greatest resources similar to Shoe Pride is just a collective like group of people. You know, I think that's that's probably the best way because everybody brings something different to the table. Everybody has different ideas, has different like, you know, external resources that could help everybody in the group. And I'm not saying, you know, make a bunch of friends who you can just sit down and like talk, okay, let's get, where do we get resources from? Like, it's still gotta be authentic, obviously. Um, but I think just having a group of people who you can trust and a group of people who are willing to, you know, see the same changes that you are trying to make. I think that's probably one of the greatest resources you, you can get. And Amber. I just dropped in the chat the NEA LGBTQ caucus book list and then you can also look on the website they have some other resources around like health and um, different things like that but the book list is really exhaustive and I love it because it crosses not only just like the the cookie cutter LGBTQ but also black and Latinx LGBTQ troops and all of that um, so definitely check that out I dropped it in the chat <laughs> We also dropped in the a quick guide to help anyone in the audience understand the importance of people's pronouns. So if anyone needs that separately, um, we'd be happy to also send that to everyone who registered uh, to the event. But the guide is there um, in the chat box. Uh, so my next question would be this. Um, what would you do to encourage people who are listening in this audience and and you know people you interact with every day in their everyday routines how how do those folks who are not necessarily identifying as lgbtq or queer how do they become educated about the issues um and 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 get the right information um that will help them to be able to to you know progress in terms of their own thinking and how they interact with lgbtq people and I will post that to Jaden first. Jalen, I'm sorry, Jalen. No worries. Um, one of my biggest things is you have to go out and do the work. So I'm not about to just you know give you a bunch of list of resources and saying here read this, read this, read this, do this, do this, because I'm not everything queer. I'm not. I don't know everything. No queer person is you know a complete expert on everything that there is to be queer. I'm an expert on my experience. That's the only thing I can claim to be an expert on. Um, so I would say, you know, first you need to empathize with people, not even just people who you may be affiliated with, like maybe some of your friends, family. You should still be empathizing with people who you haven't met yet, with a community that you haven't met yet. And that should be your drive and that should be your passion to want to, you know, go out, educate yourself, learn more, spread this knowledge, uh, continue these conversations so that we can get justice, so that everyone can feel comfortable being their authentic selves 
literally just existing. I'm not even talking about in any you know work context. I'm just being like waking up, feeling safe, and knowing that okay, I I know for a fact I will go to sleep tonight. I don't have any concern about walking out of my house feeling unsafe. I don't have any concern walking out of my bedroom if I have one, you know, feeling safe. Um, I think that itself needs to be the drive for people to go out and and learn. Elizabeth. Um, I agree with what Jaden said. LGBTQ people are not an encyclopedia. It is definitely up to the person that wants to learn to do their own research. We are here to create the history. We're not here to teach it to you. We're busy creating it. So if you do want to learn about the history, if you want to learn about the policies, it's been years. It's been years that the LGBT community has been teaching and teaching and teaching. Those that come before us that were involved in the LGBT community have been teaching. It's time to teach yourselves because the information is out there due to our predecessors in these positions teaching for so long, for so many generations. So many generations have taught all of the information is out there. All you have to do is, again, Google, like Jaden said. <laughs> Amber. I definitely echo their statements. There's so much literature that's been put out. There's YouTube videos, there's podcasts, there's tweet threads. Like, I think that in, this is a, a safe forum where people can come if you, if, to learn. Um, but that doesn't mean that if you see this Beth or Kylie or Jalen on the street, like you're going to bum rush them and ask them <laughs> whatever question. Like that's not the, the right time and place. Um, so I think just really looking at um, all of the media that's out there, taking your own notes, learning for yourself. And then if you want to ask the questions, just come respectfully. And uh, Pat Lane. Um. I guess like doing research is more on the broad spectrum of things. However, I feel like, you know, the biggest thing you can do is listen to a person who's part of that community. And if they're telling you this is how they wanna, you know, like the basic things, this is how I identify as, this is, you know, the pronouns I use, this, that, and the third. Just being respectful to, to those people and like respectful about how they are identifying identifying themselves that's like a major thing um i feel as though another thing you know asking questions is good but i feel like you wouldn't it's annoying to black people when a white person is like yeah can we, we didn't know we were being racist like can you help us not be racist <laughs> it's the same thing please <laughs> So I, I mean, like, do the research on your own. Listen to people, because people who are part of this community, we're not aliens. Like, we're not, like, we're humans, too. Like, that's it. Like, just accept people for who they are. It doesn't matter who they love. Like, everybody's, per like, is a person. Like, we're humans. So just being respectful, I feel like that's it. Because for me, when, like, I'm talking to my parents or whatever, and or, like, family members, I think like the biggest thing I can understand from their conversation is that they see this as like some sort of disease or something like that, or like a mental illness. And I'm just like, um, no, it's really not like that. I could look at you and be like, yo, you like men? That's sick. But like, <laughs> you know, like it's the same thing. So just accepting people, being respectful is a big thing. If you want to be an ally, do your research, but don't speak for like the people because you don't know how they feel. Like I said, it's like the same as a white person trying to tell a black person to educate them. Do your own research, listen. Another thing I guess would be like, because social media again is very popular. If you see something circulating around about helping a person that's part of the community, do your part on that one. But also don't just click share, go and learn about it, you know, and see how else you can help that. It's, there's a lot of things we could do. If you do have a question, I guess, Try not to bombard a person who's part of the community, but come respectfully. It's just all about respect, how you speak, and that's it. 
I was um, having a con because I, I have two daughters and one of them lives in Manhattan. She was saying that at her, at her job they had this, um, uh, you know, come together moment where, you know, as an organization they're struggling with, you know, how do they make the space more inclusive and, and, and um, the fascinating thing she told me was that her company went out and hired a, a, a consultant firm to do a survey of the staff to confirm what the staff had already told them, which was that you're, you're, this is not an environment that is delivering the same employment experience for black women as it is for white women. And so the black women had already complained and told them that, you know, this, this space is not positive for us, but then they, they had to go out and spend money on a consultant firm to tell them what they've already been told, right? And so one of the things that we talked about was that, you know, and, and it's related to what I was saying about how do you have these dialogues with people and how do you, you know, you know, you, you bring these issues out and how do you address them? It's sometimes very traumatizing to have to relive your traumatizing experience with folks who keep asking you the same things and uh, not realizing that every time you ask me, well, you know, as a white person, you know, I realize my privileges, you know, how do I, you know, you know, you guys have had a you know, terrible experience, you know, what was that like for you and how can I change it? Well, how many times do I have to relive this trauma? Because I live this every day. This has been my experience every day. And now you want me to keep talking to you about it <laughs> when I'm, I'm tired of talking about it. <laughs> and you go about and figure that stuff out. You fuck y'all get together and you do it. <laughs> okay. And you check back in with me and I'll let you know if you're in, on the right track or or if you're no, no, come on, we gotta pull you back. And so um I do understand, right? Why is it the responsibility of the oppressed person to teach the oppressor how to behave better? Um, you know, that's a tremendous responsibility. So look at all the responsibility that you have as an LGBTQ person who's non-binary, who's black or Latino. You know, not only do you have to be in this world to try to be authentic in this world and live your life, but then somehow someone's given you the responsibility of, you know, altering and correcting the behavior of the oppressor. Uh, that That's a lot. That's a lot. And so, um, I totally agree with you that folks need to be doing some things on their own and taking some actions on their own and not not looking for us to be the ones that have all the answers. And that's part of what allyship is, is, is uh, you know, recognizing your privileges, whether they be privileges that are gender related, privileges that are race related, privileges that are economic related, um, you know, status, class uh, and uh, you know, working those things out in a way that you're not making me responsible for finding the answer for uh, the history of, 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 you know, oppression and inequality and the things that we have to deal with in our everyday lives. And so as we wrap up, um, I just want to, first of all, thank you for this great conversation. Uh, I am so excited about uh, you young people and your your ability to go out there and lead and change the world and to be engaging with our young children. Um, I have uh, two uh, grandchildren that are in school, well, three actually, and they're virtually learning. Um, you know, one thing that I've been concerned about is the digital divide. You know, how are our, you know, like you said, for some children getting going to school was the best experience of their lives. Being home is the problem. And so now you have kids who are in the home. Um, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, we've gotten some calls from young people who real, you know, who, who because they had to stay home and because they were going through their own gender identity stuff, you know, these issues came up because a lot of times who I am at home is not who I am when I walk out the door. And so their frustration was, OK, now I'm stuck in the house and now I still have to figure out how to be me. And now things are going to come up with my family that probably would have never come up before because I separated those two worlds and now the worlds have collided and come together. And so, uh, 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 Pat Lean, actually, you you commented on that. Um, 
you know, do you find that that is the case that's happening not just for you, but happening for others as well? I mean, honestly, little old me, if it's happening to me, it's definitely happening to a whole lot of people. And heavy on the being you in the home and then being the, like you when you step out the house, like that's really um, like a, important. And then once you're stuck in the house, it's kind of like a double consciousness thing going on. It's like, who's going to win? And it's just, and then you have to like figure out how to, like an output essentially for that. So it's really difficult. And honestly, I think whatever outlet you could use while you're in the house is like it's essential. For me, I couldn't I couldn't find an outlet while I was in the house besides like going to work and overworking myself in a sense. And you know, that could like lead to burnout and all that. And I guess the other outlet was essentially to kind of like leave home for the semester. I knew I could come to, on campus and, you know, just be here and be myself outside of my home. So that was a good thing. But I don't know, it's, it's really difficult trying to find a way to cope in, in a sense with in a household where you're not accepted fully for being you. So I'm still learning that. Once I figure out some answers, I'll let you guys know and pass that information along. But, you know, just do what you got to do. I feel like one thing in particular that has helped me through numerous, like, hard time is just talking to a close friend, just talking it out. It kind of helped, kind of let it out. And, you know, that's really it. Do you have resources at Seton Hall University, say if a, a student becomes homeless, that there's some sort of resources on, on the campus to address that? We definitely have departments and resources that help students wherever they're at. Um, so yes, absolutely. And we're happy to provide those resources to the people that registered um, for this event. But I just want to, um, Beatrice, give us a quick time check. We're at 822. So I know some students have to head out to different meetings. So I want to make sure we're respectful of everyone's time, even though this conversation has been extraordinary. And I hope that everyone is empowered to be more respectful and do their own research to become allies. Well, I mean, that concludes my list of discussion topics. Um, I would just like to remind you of the Newark Community uh, Center would love to um, have some student volunteers. And so um, if you wish to do that, please contact us through our website, which is NewarkLGBTQCenter.org. Uh, you can email info at NewarkLGBTQCenter.org. And uh, we would welcome your participation. We are looking for board members. We are looking for folks to help with our social justice work. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, there's a student uh, from Morris High School who is interested in doing some work around how the LGBTQ curriculum is presented in the classroom. Because in her conversation with me, what she told me was, I don't see myself in their curriculum and I need to do something about that. And she's been having trouble trying to get support, not only from teachers, but even from other students to be interested in it. And so if that's something you might be able to help this young lady with, uh, I would uh, encourage you to contact us because I would love to have uh, your voices at the table and your energy. This was a wonderful experience for me. I thank you all and I appreciate the invitation. No, thank you, Beatrice. You guys did such an amazing job. You know, Jalen, Amber, Patlene, Lizbeth, like round of applause. Like, yes. I wish we were in person so that you could hear it. You know, <laughs> I think everything that you said was extraordinary. And I hope, Lizbeth, I saw your comment, you know, remember to respect people's identities and don't be afraid to learn and really take the education, your own education into your own hands because these conversations are really important. And I think, Jalen, you commented earlier, but we want to continue this conversation going. So remember that on campus, SHU Pride is a huge resource for students in your community. The Newark LGBTQ Center is a huge resource um, for students and for individuals in the Essex County area. We'll make sure um, Beatrice to send the information on how to become a volunteer for the Newark LGBTQ Center out um, to everyone. But 
you know, we appreciate your stories. We appreciate you being on this panel. Um, and to everyone, I hope you guys stay safe and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Take Thank care. You guys. Bye.